I managed to get up without tripping over my dress. <laughs> that is a good thing. And I managed to walk up and down the stairs a couple of times without falling down. I'm going to keep my notes here. I'm trying to keep track of what I'm supposed to do and when I'm supposed to do it. So forgive me if I do something at the wrong time. Just play along and act like that is the way it's always been, okay? Don't make me feel bad on my first Sunday. Can I be honest with you guys? We are unbelievably thrilled to be here. We are. My entire family and I, we're just ecstatic to be at Hillside and to be in Princeton. I know it was only a few, a few short months that you all received the announcement that Pastor Lisa was going to be leaving you guys. And then a couple of weeks later, you found out that you were getting this new guy that you didn't know anything about. But it seemed like we talked about this transition for forever. I mean, we were blessed, our family was, with ample time to sell our home. We were blessed with ample time to price all of our prized treasures and sell some of them at a garage sale. And then those that people didn't want to buy, we uh, shared our treasures with the people at Goodwill. And then we were blessed to have time to pack up and live with the wonderful aroma of cardboard for several weeks. And it seemed like it drug on and on and on. I mean, how long can you really say goodbye anyway? It seemed like every week at church, someone would come up and say, Are you still here? <laughs> I began to wonder if they were anxious for me to leave. They would say, No, when is your last Sunday? Oh, we're going to miss you. You know, it was kind of like ripping off a Band-Aid very, very, very slowly. I can imagine how it was for you all as well to say goodbye to a pastor that you had come to love, to a pastor that, that had shared very intimate moments in your lives, I'm sure, and had celebrated milestones not only with your church, but also with you all as individuals. And I'm guessing that now that, that we're here, you're probably asking yourselves the question, do we really want to get close to this guy and his family? I mean, how long are they going to be here? I can't answer that exactly, but I want you to know this, that it is our hope and it's our prayer that we are here for a decade or more. We don't have any plans. This is not a stepping stone for us to travel on to greener pastures. This is where we are, and this is where we want to be. So you need to know that. And so I hope that you all will open your hearts and your families and your community to me and my family so that we can be a part of, of not only Hillside, but also of Princeton. I also hope that over the next couple of weeks, you'll indulge me just a bit, because my messages are going to be somewhat autobiographical. And my hope is that this will quicken the process for you to get to know me. I'm kind of an open book. I really am. What you see is what you get. I often don't wear this robe out in public, believe it or not. And whenever I'm grilling hamburgers at home, I don't wear this robe, I promise. <laughs> it, it took them at Methodist Temple six or eight months to even get me into a robe. So it was a bit unusual for me to adjust to it. The first time Dolly saw me in this, I didn't have this on, and she said I looked like a judge. And she laughed. Oh, she laughed. And the kids were like, are you going to wear that thing? And I said, yes, I guess I'm going to wear this thing. So my last Sunday at Methodist Temple, this dear, sweet soul came up to me. And she said, Chris, oh, Chris, that was the best message I have ever heard you give. And I was like, really? And I said, thank you so much. She followed that up with, because whenever you got here, I really wondered about you because, to be honest, <laughs> your message weren't all that great. But you've come a long way fast. I took it as a compliment, I think. I think I took that as a compliment. Maybe what she was implying is whenever you start at the very bottom, you only have one way to go, and that's up. So, so if you don't like my messages to start off with, 
um, please be patient. Because if you had hurt them four years ago, <laughs> if you think they're bad now, just, just wait. Also, apparently, I keep progressively getting better. So with a lot of hard work and your all faithful prayers, who knows? I mean, in a couple of years, I may even rise to the level of mediocre. I got a chance to listen online, the beauty of the internet, to, uh, to Nicole's wonderful message last week. And uh, she shared with you Isaiah 61, and it is one of my favorite passages. You know, I mean, I, there was a guy at, at Methodist Temple who wore a t-shirt that said, we're all God's children, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> because we're all God's favorite, aren't we? We're all God's favorite, and we all have a calling and a purpose. But as Nicole pointed out, our first calling... Our first calling is to, to God himself, is to Jesus Christ. And then we can figure out what we're going to do from there. My message today, no plan of mine, is, is kind of part of my story. And it talks about, I'm going to talk to you about what God is doing and hopefully, hopefully continues to do in my life. People he used in my life to, to draw me to himself. And then how he's continuing to work on me. Let me give you a brief snapshot. Uh, Steve did a good job explaining about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. He didn't want to be a prophet. He didn't want to wear the preacher's robe. He didn't want to talk to the people of, of Israel. He was in the southern kingdom. He was very young. He was not an old man. And, and he thought, they won't listen to me, and I don't want to do that anyway, and I don't know how to talk. And Jeremiah reassured, or God reassured Jeremiah that he had plans for him and that before he had formed him in his mother's womb, he knew him. And the same is true for us. Before God formed us in our mother's womb, God knew us before we even took our first breath. He told Jeremiah, I have set you apart, and I have appointed you to go and preach to the people of Judah. That was the southern kingdom. He didn't want to go, but he told Jeremiah, he said, I want you to go, and I'm going to tell you what to say. Oh, and by the way, your message won't always be pleasant. And they won't always want to listen to you. Jeremiah was known, some of you may have heard him called the weeping prophet. He also wrote, wrote lamentations, okay? He was known as the weeping prophet because he felt the intense, the intense agony and anguish that God felt because his chosen people, the nation of Israel, they were rebelling and they were turning against God and they didn't want God involved in their life at all. And so this grieved Jeremiah because he felt so deeply what God felt. Jeremiah told him, he said, don't listen to all these prophets that tell you everything's okay. God loves you just the way you are. There's no need to repent of your sin. He said, God wants you to repent. He wants you to turn from your sin and He wants you to turn back to him. Turn from your wicked ways, but they didn't listen. And just as Jeremiah said, they were carried off into exile into Babylon. And the passage today from t chapter 29, as Steve pointed out, was a letter from God through Jeremiah to the people of Israel who were in Babylon in exile. They wondered, even though they had left God completely out of their lives, they wondered. Has God forgotten about us? Does God care anything about us? And God reassured them through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, I've got plans for you. Even though you're in the middle of what is the most difficult circumstances of your life, I have plans for you. I'm going to give you a hope and a future. So trust in me. Don't lose hope. You see, God is constantly at work in our lives, just as he was in theirs. Many times we're even unaware that he is working in our lives. I hope there's three things you'll take away from the sermon, and I'm going to get to the part about me. And if I preach a little long today, an extra hour or two, I hope you'll indulge me. <laughs> but God uses imperfect, ordinary people, okay, for the building of his kingdom. Just ordinary, everyday people. And then the other thing I want you to take away is that I want you to pay attention to the defining moments in your lives. I don't believe in coincidences. God's hand is often at work in our lives through the people that we interact with. 
And then lastly, I want you to, to somehow learn that you have a story to tell. You have a faith story to tell. And we're to share that with, with the world around us, with our church, with, with kids, and with our community. Because it will make a difference in the lives of others. Now a little bit about me. If you detect a bit of a southern drawl, as Steve said, I am from Appalachia. Okay? It's a big word for a boy from Kentucky, Appalachia. And occasionally my Kentucky ease comes out, especially whenever I've been around my family, and my eyes get drawn out really far. Eyes, that's I for those people who have that Indiana dialect. And then occasionally I throw in a, a y'all, okay? Which, in, just in case I should happen to go there, the plural of y'all is all y'all. Okay? Anybody else speak that language? Can I get an amen? Okay. <laughs> I was born and I spent the first 18 years of my life in Somerset, Kentucky. It is a sleepy little town. It's growing now. But it was a sleepy little town of about 10,000 people. It's nestled at the foot of the Appalachian Mountains on, on a beautiful lake, Lake Cumberland. I don't know if you've ever been there. Just a beautiful lake. It's in the southeastern part of the state, about 75 miles south of Lexington. It has a state highway running through it, Highway 27, but it actually doesn't run through it, okay? It's a couple of miles outside of town, and the town's kind of grown out there to the highway. But in the center of town, there's a town square, and there's a courthouse. It's a quaint little town. Uh, some buildings have been remodeled. Some of them have even been torn down, and they've built these, these beautiful new buildings around the square. You know, industry is growing there, okay? See, about 20 years ago, in northern Kentucky, they, they, this little company called Toyota put a plant in northern Kentucky. And I don't know if you all know this or not, but Toyota has a lot of suppliers. You might, also, you might know that. They do. And, and down just north of Somerset, they have a wheel plan. I forget what it's called now. They changed name two or three times. And a couple other things are located there. I don't know if you're starting to see some similarities between where, where I grew up and Princeton, but uh, it was eerie. Because, you see, coming to Princeton is a lot like coming home to me because it reminds me very much of where I grew up. I'm the youngest of three children. My two older sisters are eight and ten years older than I am, and I grew up with three mothers. Three mothers. I stuttered until I was about eight because I couldn't get a word in edgewise. Okay? Why the gap? There's a gap in between me and my next sister. Coincidentally, I was born on her eighth birthday. We just celebrated. She turned 50, and I turned 42 July 3rd this week. And so we got to celebrate our, my birthday, and I had some wonderful peanut butter pie. I like peanut butter pie, by the way. <laughs> Just being honest. All kinds of peanut butter pie. We won't go there. Anyway, so my mother miscarried about four months into a pregnancy, about five years before I was born. And my parents told me that, that they prayed for a child. More specifically, they prayed for a son. And I was told that whenever I was born, even the doctor cried tears of joy. Not my words, my mother's, okay? Even the doctor cried tears of joy because the son had finally arrived. And, and I'm guessing that by about age five, because I was all boy, my parents were wondering what had they prayed for and why did God answer their prayer in this way? Because I was a handful. I spent more time on a little stool underneath a gold harvest yellow phone in the kitchen looking out the back door at other children playing than I actually did outside because I was in trouble almost every day of my life. When did I start attending church? I started attending Pleasant Hill Baptist Church uh, about nine months before I was born. Okay, Do the math. Nine months before I was born, my family was always at church. My dad taught Sunday school. My mom headed the nursery. My dad chaired finance and personnel and trustees at various times. And my mother was a kitchen angel. You know, and our, our church had these wonderful children's programs. And two, two individuals in particular, Vert Trees and Shirley Molden, they really had an impact on my life because they introduced our church to this program called the Bible Drill. And they said, how would you like to learn 30 or so verses of Scripture? Memorize them and recite them and learn all the books in the Bible. And then we'll teach you about 20 or so passages like the Beatitudes and, and, and the, the Ten Commandments and those sort of things. And you'll remember and be able to find them in the Bible. 
That didn't sound that hard to me. I mean, all, every, book, every book in the Bible, 30 verses, that just didn't sound that hard. So I said, okay, I'll sign up to do that. Little did I know that they would spend hours working with us. My reward wasn't the plaque I got for, for three years as a state Bible Bowl winner. My reward was the seeds that they planted in my heart that just bloomed and continue to bloom. So if you want to make a difference in the world, invest in the lives of children and youth. Plant seeds that will bloom. I have an, I have an affection for church camp because I understand kids just got back from church camp. Is that right? And uh, um, I was nine years old, went to church camp for the first time, and I was glad to be away from home. Okay, I was glad to be away from home. Nine years old, we played games, we had track times, we did lots of mischief, we ate good food, just lots of fun, but they made you go to worship every night and every morning, I think. And we prayed a lot, and I didn't like that. And so me being the good Baptist boy that I was, of course, I sat in the back row of the chapel. I didn't want to be anywhere near the front. Um, but I remember that amongst about 400 kids, the preacher's name was, was Larry Skidmore. And he preached a message. I couldn't tell you what it was about. But all I know is that Jesus met me in that pew at church camp. And I came back. And after a few weeks of going through what they called a new members class, which is similar to our confirmation class, I was baptized. I was dunked, if you will. And my life was forever changed. But the rest of my childhood was pretty typical. We had a drive-in in Somerset, Kentucky. I remember that. I remember whenever they got the first Wendy's. That was a really big deal because all we had was McDonald's and Findlay's and, and Rose's department store and a, and a drug store that I used to walk to as a kid after going to the movies downtown and would get, would get chocolate milkshakes at. That's the only thing I remember. I can't remember the name of it. Good chocolate milkshakes. I like chocolate milkshakes too, by the way. <laughs> it was a Mayberry-ish existence. It really was. Well, after a brief hiatus after graduation, I'll, I'll fill you in on, on what I was doing post-high school a little bit next week. But I went to Western Kentucky University, and I got my bachelor's degree in public relations. While I was, over the summer, I was an intern at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. I don't know if anybody's ever heard it. They did this little project there called the Manhattan Project. Anybody hear that? And so I was an intern at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I was taking my last class at, U, at UT. And I had one of those aha moments, okay? The short version is I was headed home. I was in my parents' car because mine was being repaired. Good thing because it broke down on the interstate. And I did the responsible thing that a teenage boy would do. I hitchhiked to, to the next exit to call my parents. And they came to get me. But before we could get the car towed even, Someone broke into the car, and I had laying in that car, I had all sorts of laundry and other valuable stuff. They left my dirty underwear, but they took my work bag, my briefcase, and inside that briefcase were my checkbook. It was files and important paperwork, but it also had my disks that had every paper, every project Everything I had spent the last five years of my life doing in college was in that briefcase. Responsible packing, I know, okay? For you that are under the age of 30, okay? Diskettes or disk are what we used to save electronic files on, okay? Sort of like a thumb drive, only a lot more cumbersome and don't hold quite as much, okay? So all that was taken. Coincidentally, I got my checkbook back with a nice little note. But I never got the discs that had all that hard work on it. And I felt like God was saying to me, Oh, son, you have left me out of your life for the last five years. You've got these big dreams. You've got these big plans. You've had a lot of fun. But now let me show you what your life and your hard work is worth without me. All gone. Five years worth of hard work. Don't ever know what happened to me. My first job out of college, I was a marketing manager at the Oak Ridge Convention and Visitors Bureau. It's a big long word for tourism agency. I think you all have got one here in town as well. 
just outside of Knoxville. I got married in 94, had my first daughter in 97. She is the only one from Tennessee. She sings Rocky Top. No, she doesn't. I'm kidding. She gets embarrassed when dad, dad dances to it, though. In 1998, I moved to Evansville, and then a little bit later that year, I started working at a little company down the road here in Darmstadt called the Bauer House, and I spent 10-plus years as director of marketing and special events throwing parties at the Bauer House. In 2002, God blessed me with daughter number three, or daughter number two, Berkeley, and then 2004, daughter number three, Briley. In September of 2004, I had a conversation on my back deck with my mother-in-law who had just gotten back from a Joyce Meyer conference. And there was this discussion about sin. You know that sin that so easily entangles? That one that's the Achilles heel of sin that you just can't get over? You know, some people were talking about coveting or envy, you know, or lust or lying. It was just those ones that keep coming up over and over again. And before I could, you know, before I realized what was going on, my mother-in-law turned to me and she said, Chris, you don't have any of those, do you? Because you're perfect. And what flew out of my mouth shocked even me. I said, misuse of my gifts and talents for God. I have misused my talent for God. The next out of her mouth shocked even me. And she said, Chris, have you ever been called into ministry? And I said, absolutely not. I settled that one a long time ago. Never happened. Not going to ever happen. That is no plan of mine. No part in my future. I had a conversation with my mother a couple of days later, and I was telling her about this conversation. And ironically, she asked me the same thing. Chris, have you ever been called into ministry? And I said, absolutely not. That is no plan of mine. Settled that a long time ago. And almost like a movie reel in my head, I recall this conversation that I had with the Reverend C.E. Jacobs. You know, almost one of those conversations that you have in passing, but really has no impact on you whatsoever. See, Pastor Jacobs was my, my pastor for the first 19 years of my life. And the first time I was home from college, Brother Jacobs came up to me. He said, Chris had a dream about you. I said, really? He said, yeah. I dreamed that you were standing in a pulpit talking to a large crowd of people. I told him that must have been a nightmare because that will never happen. It was no plan of mine. I sent him a picture a couple years ago, by the way, of me in a pulpit. He's in his 80s. After that conversation on my deck, I endured a couple of weeks of sleepless nights. I was miserable. There was no peace about me whatsoever. I would catch myself up in the middle of the night searching the Scriptures. And I found myself coming back to this passage in 1 Samuel. You know the one in 1 Samuel where Hannah prays for a child and then promises God if God will give her a child, she'll give him back to God. God fulfills his promise. Hannah has Samuel. She takes him to the temple, gives him to Eli. Samuel's laying down, and he's awakened in the temple by Samuel. Samuel. He goes to Eli. Eli tells him, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down. He does this two more times. The third time he gets up, or the, the fourth time he gets up, and he goes to Eli, and Eli says, Samuel, it's the Lord. If he calls again, your responses speak, for your servant is listening. I scheduled an appointment with my pastor a couple of days later. And I shared with him all this unrest and this, this turmoil that I had inside going on in me. How I just couldn't get any peace. But before I could get to the part to tell him that I had been searching the scriptures, he looked at me and he said, Chris, you feel kind of like Samuel, don't you? I thought that was just a coincidence. Must be a coincidence, right? called my mother a couple days later and shared with her that I indeed thought I was having this call to ministry. It was no plan of mine, and I didn't want it. But I thought that's what God wanted me to do. My mother again shared with me the story, which I had heard again and again, and my sisters, I'm sure, rolled their eyes about how I was born, and even the doctor cried, and they gave him this beautiful baby boy. And 
But then my mother went on to tell me, she said, Chris, whenever the doctor placed you in my arms, I prayed and I promised God that he had given me this child and I was giving you back to him. My mother never shared that with me. She said she didn't want me to confuse what were her dreams or her plans for my life with my dreams or my plans and, and confuse me figuring out what God's purpose for my life was. To be sure, ministry was absolutely no plan of mine. I did not want to be a pastor at all. The last thing in the world I ever wanted to be was a pastor. But I'll tell you something. For the last four plus years, there's not been a morning that I have gotten out of bed that I have not hit the ground thanking God that I get to be a pastor. I love it. I love God's people. I love preaching. I love teaching. I love visiting. I tell people that I had two qualifications to be a pastor. I have a very big mouth, and I love God's people. I hope that over the next 2, 3, 10, 12, 15 years that I'll get to love you and that you'll love me and my family because we are so excited to be here. We are so grateful that we get the opportunity to serve God at Hillside United Methodist Church in Princeton, Indiana. You know, God is constantly at work in our lives. Many times we are even unaware that He is working in our lives. Ministry was no plan of mine and God kept sending these people into my life. Sometimes shouting and screaming. Sometimes with big neon signs flashing saying, go this way. And I said, ministry was no plan of mine. And God kept saying, Chris, I know the plans I have for you. And if you'll just turn to me and pray to me and seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. And I'll bring you back from that place to which you found yourself in. I'll carry you back to me. So what does all that mean for you? Well, I hope you've gotten to know me a little bit. Part two of how I met my wonderful wife and wound up with two bonus daughters, Chandler and Amanda made our family complete will be next week. So I hope you'll come back. I hope you remember, though, that you have a story to tell, too. And I hope you'll remember the people that have made a difference in your life. We're excited to be here.